He survived secret CIA plots, undercover mafia assassination attempts, and even the threat of nuclear annihilation. The weapons of war must be abolished. He turned Cuba from a colonial paradise into a player on the world stage. Our troubles in this hemisphere are being generated by Castro's Cuba. This is the story of Fidel Castro, a communist icon who's ruled Cuba for half a century. A dictator only 90 miles from U.S. shores, who's outlasted nine American presidents. This is Castro, declassified. A tropical island paradise spilling with rum, rumba, and roulette. This was the Cuba most Americans knew in the 1950s. Glorious beaches, glittering casinos, gambling, music, dancing. In the 50s in, in Havana, it was wide open. I mean, I had many conversations about my father about what it was like. And you have to understand that it was basically paradise. I mean, anything you wanted, you could get. But just below the surface, the rhythm of revolution was beating. In the urban underground and throughout the Cuban countryside, people were demanding change. The unrest stemmed back to 1898, when Cubans fought to rid themselves of their Spanish colonial masters. But then the United States intervened, committing nearly 20,000 troops to fight for Cuba's independence. An even bigger investment would follow. Cuban sugar, Cuban water, Cuban electricity, Cuban telephones. The entire economic infrastructure of the island gradually was bought up or invested in by American capital. And this, of course, laid the groundwork for a great deal of nationalist sentiment in Cuba. This was the Cuba that Castro grew up in, in the 1930s and 1940s. Fidel Castro and the young university students who begin to cut their teeth politically and want to create a Cuba for themselves, their nationalism revolves around getting the Americans out. 1952. With corruption in the government rampant, a young Fidel Castro decided to run for Congress under a clean government party banner. But just before election day, the self-appointed chief of the military, Fulgencio Batista, cancelled the elections, pushed out the Cuban president, Carlos Prio Socorras, in a bloodless coup, and took control of the island republic. Corruption increased. Batista also felt free to dip into the national treasury, to ignore the national budget, to allocate the nation's resources at his own personal discretion. He did not see much of a distinction between his private use of power and the public purse. The coup really became the straw that broke the camel's back, the sign that electoral politics were not an option and that trying to engage peacefully would just lead one either to a jail cell or to exile. On the 26th of July, 1953, Castro made a reckless radical move. He led a group of about 150 men to storm one of the biggest military garrisons in Cuba, the Moncada Barracks at Santiago de Cuba, on the eastern side of the island. The goal was to seize enough arms to mount a military revolution. The result was a bloodbath. They failed miserably. Many of them died. Those that weren't killed were sent to jail, including Fidel. Castro, however, turned the defeat into a platform for victory. The 26th of July would mark the birth of the Revolución in Cuba. Castro has a way of converting almost all defeats or potential defeats into mobilizing activities. That is, activities that he uses then to turn the situation. In 1953, 
Castro should have been dead. July 26th became a campaign slogan, the new name of the new movement to overturn the government. Castro's trial was televised, a bad mistake, giving him the perfect national stage for his stirring oratory. The man who should have been picked off by Batista and his mighty army, the man who had just a handful of ragged revolutionaries, rallied the country. He essentially says that he did the right thing, the patriotic thing, the necessary thing, that he was the defender of the Cuban Constitution, that he was the defender of the Republic, because Batista had usurped power in, in the 1952 election, and that all Cubans should really have followed him if they were patriots. From prison, Castro produced a manuscript of his words, history will absolve me. With public opinion firmly in his favor, and thanks to pleas from Castro's politically connected family, he and others were released in an amnesty after serving less than two years. But informed of Batista's plans to have him killed after his release, Castro fled to Mexico to plot his next move. On the 26th of November, 1956, Castro returned from Mexico on a leaky old boat called the Granma with a few dozen men. On the 2nd of December, they were ambushed by the Cuban army. Most of them were killed outright. Castro survived and with a handful of others escaped to the Sierra Maestra mountains. There they hid out for nearly two years, building a revolutionary army and developing their political philosophy and strategy. In mid-1958, Batista makes the decision to launch a general offensive over 10,000 troops, tanks, motorized equipment against Castro's forces in eastern Cuba. Among the growing band of revolutionaries with Castro in the mountains was a young Argentine destined to become the world's most recognized revolutionary, Ernesto Che Guevara. Castro's forces stood at less than a thousand. Despite the odds, Batista made no inroads. The equipment gets stuck in the mud. It's the middle of the rainy season. These are unprofessional soldiers. The uh, soldiers, many of them, do not want to fight. The general offensive is a disaster. Troops retreat. Many surrender. And from mid-1958 to December, what you see is the armed forces of the Republic of Cuba collapse. Throughout Cuba, people were becoming more and more repulsed by the brutality of the Batista regime. In his attempt to hold on to power, he jailed and killed thousands. The tighter he squeezed, the more his power slipped away. There were lots of acts of violence and sabotage going on. Uh, the electrical system was spotty and, and, uh, and streets would be blocked and there would be shootings and uh, it was generally not a time uh, to be out and about. New Year's Eve, 1958. In Havana, the roulette wheels were turning and the rum was flowing. Wealthy revelers had no idea what was about to happen. Revolution was knocking at the door. The life they knew was about to come crashing down. New Year's Eve 1958. While unsuspecting revelers in Cuban casinos played cards, placed bets, danced and toasted in the new year, on the streets and in the Cuban countryside, revolution was bubbling over. After fighting a guerrilla war for the better part of a decade, Fidel Castro's opportunity had arrived. Like everyone else, President Fulgencio Batista celebrated at midnight, but for him, time had run out. He gathers together on New Year's Eve after an appropriately festive party. Uh, his buddies, political, military, and other uh, social leaders, 
fills about six airplanes and leaves the country. The nation celebrated. People danced in the streets, filled with hope for a new beginning, a new Cuba. When Batista fled and news spread that he had left the country, Cubans poured out into the street. It was at a time of enormous excitement, happiness, hopefulness. Cubans looked to his departure and to their success at getting him out as a collective victory. Castro took several days to enter Havana, driving across the country, rallying seas of people to his side. It wasn't just a march of triumph, it was also a march to do the politics across the island of securing support for the 26th of July movement. By the time he arrived in Havana, a million people had taken to the streets to celebrate a victory they saw as their own, and to hear Castro speak. A bunch of white doves land on his shoulder and arm as he's making a speech. Now, for anyone who knows anything about Cuban religion, Santeria, the white dove is a very significant animal. And this immediately is the signal. Fidel is the deliverer, O Batala, as he's called in that language. The deliverer, he is the man who is going to take Cuba from its helpless status and make it into a strong people, a strong nation. But for the U.S. government, Castro was far from a savior. Although Castro met Vice President Nixon and appeared in several interviews on U.S. television, the period of goodwill was brief. The new government mounted a campaign to teach literacy and reading to peasants around the country and also began to focus on education and also public health. Just months after the revolution, hundreds of people were killed by firing squad after show trials. Famed revolutionary Che Guevara was the commander of the prison and took a personal interest in interrogating Batista supporters. People wanting revenge for the brutality of the Batista regime shouted, to the wall, the site where people faced the firing squad. There were lots of executions, and we thought, well, they got what they deserve. These are bad men. Uh, they've obviously done some terrible things, and so he's cleaning house. Uh, but they kept on, and they kept on. Uh, and there were hundreds and then thousands. And they moved the trials to the sports palace, and there were thousands of people in the stands screaming at the top of their lungs, uh, paredon, which means to the wall. Castro's next move was to redistribute land and press on with agrarian reform. By today's standards, that agrarian reform would be looked at as enormously moderate. But by the standards of 1959 and the Cold War, the agrarian reform was seen by the United States and by American landowners in Cuba as an enormous threat. Confirming American fears, Castro declared himself a communist and began to build an alliance with the Soviets. Russia now had a staunch ally just 90 miles from the United States. Over the next couple of years, U.S. operatives devised all manner of secret assassination schemes. And we now know as a result of declassified materials that uh, the Eisenhower administration had already uh, been in, in contact with the Mafia about killing him, about assassinating him. Some of the CIA's more bizarre plots included slipping Castro poison pills and exploding cigars, putting powder in his boots to make his beard fall out, and spraying LSD around a radio station where Castro was to speak. The CIA actually was ordered to compile a top secret history of all these attempts. Uh, and, and that document, uh, over 100 pages, uh, details, chronicles um, all of these schemes. 
They range from exploding conch shells to poison cigars to assassination rifles to poison pens. None of these efforts succeeded, but they certainly uh, show the creativity, at least in the laboratory, of the CIA and its multiple efforts to kill Fidel Castro. When John F. Kennedy became president, he inherited from Eisenhower a more ambitious secret plan to overthrow Castro, the Bay of Pigs operation, a plan to train Cuban exiles to storm the island and take over the government. Recently declassified documents reveal the CIA hired the Mafia to murder Castro just before the Bay of Pigs operation was launched. The CIA uh, paramilitary uh, director Richard Bissell, who was the architect of the Bay of Pigs, uh, had agreed to use the U.S. Mafia to smuggle poison pills created by the CIA uh, onto the island and somehow get them into Castro's food. But that CIA plot failed as well. Miami was already becoming a little bit like Casablanca in Second World War. There were all kinds of conspiracies, all kinds of uh, activity against the Cuban uh, Revolution. And I got involved in a lot of the, those activities. I was, uh, you might call it, a militant anti-Castro. March 1961. In Guatemala, the CIA quietly put together a brigade of about 1,500 civilians and began training them. The United States was preparing an assault on Castro and his government. This time, it was all or nothing. This was war. The American-backed insurgents planned to land at a place known as the Bay of Pigs. In 1961, El Comandante Fidel Castro seized power in Cuba. In his first months, he announced his reforms for education and health care, while at the same time reducing civil liberties. Back in the U.S., the CIA was targeting Castro with several bizarre assassination plots and the Bay of Pigs operation. We didn't know we were going to land on the Bay of Pigs until pr probably two days before. We, we always thought that we were going to be dropped or land near the mountains. Castro's intelligence knew well in advance about America's plans and used the attack as an opportunity to round up his enemies. The Cuban government had the opportunity to arrest uh, the whole, all the underground and all the opposition, whether they were in fact opposition or not, they just picked up everyone they thought could possibly turn against them. From inside Havana, the U.S. attack seemed to be going badly from the start. The exiles were quickly killed or captured. I remember telling the uh, militia man that captured us, I said, okay, give me some water and then shoot me. The exiles were held for a year and a half. While in prison, they were visited by Castro. And he came very nicely saying, boys, how is the revolution treating you? Almost in a paternal way. He managed to get a good number of us to applaud him for what he was saying. Okay, that showed me that this man had an ability of persuasion that again is not common among political leaders. After the Bay of Pigs fiasco, even the CIA's own top secret report dubbed the operation the perfect failure. This report was so scathing in its, in its criticism of the CIA's own mishandling of this operation uh, that the director of the CIA at the time, uh, John McCone, um, took the report. Uh, there was about 20 or 30 copies that had been circulated. He asked for every single one to be returned, um, destroyed all but a couple, and kept those in a safe uh, where they were hidden away from history for decades. Kennedy had lost face and lost the battle. But a new war 
an ongoing secret war to bring down Castro was already underway. And it would bring the world closer than it had ever been before, to the edge of nuclear war. It was not until after the Bay of Pigs and the abysmal failure uh, and humiliation that the administration suffered and that he suffered personally as a, a new president uh, that I think you begin to have a, a major change and then it does become an obsession, especially on Robert Kennedy's part. In the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs operation, the president and his brother, Robert Kennedy, the U.S. Attorney General, were more determined than ever to get Castro. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. He now decided he would really pursue uh, Cuba in a much more ferocious and determined way, and Castro understood that about Kennedy, that the United States doesn't take defeat lightly. The president encouraged his brother to lead what one CIA operative described as an ongoing secret war, Operation Mongoose. Clandestine operations that included bombing sugar mills, burning farms, and blowing up factories. In the late 1980s, we were able to get almost the entire record of Operation Mongoose declassified. And it has become an infamous, legendary set of, 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 of covert actions. A multifaceted, concerted effort to overthrow the Cuban government, where we would weekly send raiding parties into Cuba to supply guerrillas inside Cuba with arms, to blow up factories, to burn fields, to engage in small terror acts, to assassinate Fidel Castro. And so Mongoose came to be the kind of example of what it means to fight low-intensity warfare in the third world. August 1961. Recently declassified material reveals top Kennedy aide Richard Goodwin flew to South America for a secret meeting with Che Guevara, the representative Fidel had sent to broker a deal. Goodwin describes the secret meeting and how it took place in an apartment in Uruguay. And essentially, as is revealed in the memo, Che Guevara offered, in Castro's name, three major concessions to the United States. He said that essentially Cuba would cut or reduce greatly its military ties to the Soviet Union, the security. It would stop exporting revolution, another security threat. And it would agree to compensate the U.S. companies that it had expropriated in 59 and 60. The three issues that the United States had with Cuba. In return, Che Guevara said to Goodwin, just leave us alone. Shea also presented a gift from Castro to Kennedy. Fidel had sent along a box of Monte Cristos that everybody knew at the time were Kennedy's favorite cigar. Goodwin took the uh, cigars along with a message back to Kennedy, reported to Kennedy. Kennedy lit up one of the cigars and said, pretty good. He says, actually, Goodwin, I ought to have given you the first one to smoke. Kennedy referring to a plot to kill Castro with a poison cigar. Kennedy then listened to Goodwin's report of the secret deal offered by Fidel and Shea. And they both had the same reaction. This is a sign of weakness. So not only should we not uh, make an accommodation, we should turn up the heat. Because we maybe can get rid of them or get more out of them. In October 1962, Soviet missiles arrived in Cuba, pointing in the direction of the United States. 
The clock was ticking on the Cuban Missile Crisis as the two superpowers watched and waited. When the US blockaded Cuba, American ships were brought into direct military conflict with Soviet ships and submarines. The world was on the brink of nuclear holocaust. Kennedy met with Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, they say it's a military threat, we have to go in, we have to knock them out right away or invade. They want both. And Kennedy says that it isn't a military threat, it doesn't really make any difference militarily. He says, what difference does it make if you get blown up by a missile fired from the Soviet Union or one fired from Cuba? Uh, in either case, they, he says, they have enough to kill us anyway. He sees it as a political act uh, on Khrushchev's part to uh, appear to change the balance of power. That difference is extremely important during the first week because most of the people in the room initially favor a bombing. Recently released tape recordings made secretly in the White House reveal the tension between President Kennedy and his top military brass. At one point, Kennedy leaves the room. General LeMay, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Wheeler, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Shoup, the Chief of Staff of uh, the Marines. Of course, they don't know they're being taped. Do the sound of a and do it right, and quit bringing it around. And basically, they say the President's a coward. Whatever Kennedy thought privately, publicly, he was ready to go head-to-head -head with the Soviets and Castro. With Soviet missiles just 90 miles from U.S. shores, there was too much at stake. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. With the future of the world hanging in the balance, recently declassified documents from Cuba reveal the assumptions and misinformation that made Castro believe the U.S. knew more than in fact it did. Castro knew there were nuclear weapons on the island. And he thought the United States knew this too. He couldn't imagine that the United States, with the best intelligence service in the world, did not know that there were nuclear weapons already on the island of Cuba. Castro was convinced the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear attack on Cuba. And he says to Khrushchev, don't get caught with your rifles down. If you see the United States invading Cuba, then you must first launch the nuclear attack against the United States. Mistakenly, Castro believed this because he thought the United States knew more than it actually knew. And so there is this sense that he was willing to go to the brink. As for ordinary Cubans... They imagined that they were going to be destroyed. They would fight to the last person and a lot of Cubans would die. This is going to be an invasion by the United States. Everyone's going to die. The Cubans weren't alone. In the USSR, the US, and even in Europe, ordinary people talked about and prepared for nuclear war. Many believe the world never came closer to Armageddon than that week at the end of October 1962. Khrushchev had no intention to start nuclear war. He was at Second World War. He repeated many times that when you're watching movie, documentary, uh, reading stories about war, it is nothing there with the realities because it's much more dirty, much more cruel, much more bloody. Recently declassified Soviet documents indicate they had no desire for war. The Soviets knew that U.S. missiles outnumbered them 10 to 1. And he saw the destruction of the Soviet land. He didn't want to destroy his land second time for the interest of the Fidel Castro. Documents also reveal a rocky relationship between the Soviets and Castro. He became Soviet ally. That bring a huge headache to my father because it is one simple rule. If you want to be a great country and leader of the great country, 
you have to protect all your allies to show to all others that you are strong enough to protect them. On the 26th of October 1962, Castro wrote to Khrushchev saying he expected a U.S. attack was imminent. And he tells Khrushchev, if it's going to be an attack, an invasion, you should launch nuclear weapons first. This horrified Nikita Khrushchev, and it was one of the factors that led Khrushchev to so quickly agree to Kennedy's offer to end the crisis. Khrushchev wrote back to Castro. He says basically, uh, my dear comrade Fidel Castro, uh, I understand your reasons, but I don't agree with you. Uh, launching a nuclear first strike against the United States will uh, not solve anything, but will initiate a thermonuclear world war in which we will all be incinerated. And he very much mentions Cuba. He says Cuba will be burned in the fires of war. It's a very, very dramatically written letter. And though Castro was seen at that point in Moscow as being slightly nuts for, for wanting to start a nuclear war. On the 28th of October, the two superpowers came to an agreement. The USSR agreed to remove their missiles from Cuba after the US agreed to remove their missiles from Turkey. And the US promised not to invade Cuba. But the idea of assassinating Castro wasn't dead yet. An assassin's bullet was coming, but it would be for John Kennedy, not Fidel Castro. And in the days leading up to the president's death, the Kennedy administration adopted a dual strategy, make peace with Castro or assassinate him. On the day that Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, his emissary, Jean Daniel, a French reporter, was sitting with Castro in Varadero in Cuba with an agenda that Kennedy had given him to go over with Castro for a rapprochement. As they had begun to discuss the agenda itself, one of Castro's aides interrupted him with the news that Kennedy had just been shot in Dallas. And of course, that ended the session right there. At that moment, a top CIA officer was meeting with a spy high up in the Cuban military, codenamed Amlash. And giving him poison pen which had been uh, crafted in the technical services division of the CIA uh, and saying that he was going to also provide uh, a very potent uh, liquid, a poison, to go in the pen um, and it described to this uh, asset what he needed to do. He needed to get close enough to actually touch Fidel Castro with this pen which had a very sharp hidden syringe needle in the tip. The agent said, well, this is terrible. I, I was expecting a major weapon. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a serious assassin. How dare you? This guy wanted to take a pistol or a machine gun into the presidential palace and kill Fidel Castro in a dramatic way. And here they were handing him a poison pen. He pushed it away. Kennedy was dead and Castro was alive. Despite the ongoing secret efforts to kill him, despite the threat of nuclear holocaust, the seemingly indestructible leader of the tiny island nation survived. Castro was now a player on the world stage, and he would use his new stature to fire up his revolution. Castro was about to begin a new series of battles, and although assassination was still part of the game plan, someone else would fall to the assassin's bullet someone very close to Castro. By 1963, the ongoing clandestine effort to oust Castro was failing. Instead, the superpowers had set their nuclear sights on each other across the few miles of water that separated the US and Cuba. Castro had survived the Cuban Missile Crisis and thrived. As the next few decades proved, despite his enemies, he seemed indestructible.
After the Cuban Missile Crisis, Castro made himself a player in international politics. At the urging of revolutionaries like Che Guevara, he became a third world hero as he sent armies and experts to help in revolutionary battles in Africa and Central America. And it was Castro who brought the Soviets into these revolutionary battles. Angola was the Cuban initiative, and it was Castro who lured the Soviets in. The Soviets were reluctant to help the Nicaraguan government. It was Castro who got the Soviets to provide armaments for the Sandinistas. Over and over again, it's Castro somehow convincing the Soviets to invest in his projects. I would classify Castro as a, one of the world's greatest pickpockets. 1967. Castro's most famous partner in exporting revolution was his longtime revolutionary associate, Ernesto Che Guevara. While Che was supporting revolution in Bolivia, the CIA allegedly hired Cuban exile Felix Rodriguez to hunt him down. During the combat, he was wounded on his right leg. Uh, his rifle was shot out. Uh, most of the guerrilla were killed, and he was captured alive. And then look at him and say, I'm sorry, I tried my best. He understood. He turned white like a piece of paper, but he said, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. Just before Shea was executed, Rodriguez took a last photograph. It was uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon when I left him. And about one time, Bolivian time, uh, I heard the burst. And I took note at that time, that was the time that he was executed. Castro got rid of his enemies by jailing them, killing them, or throwing them off the island. In 1980, a group of Cubans tried to escape the country through the Peruvian embassy. Soon, thousands of people were hammering at the door there to get out of Cuba. As world public opinion started coming down on Castro, he announced that anyone who wanted to leave could leave. It was a, a smear on the Cuban uh, society that 125,000 people wanted to leave Cuba and run to the United States and he used this as an opportunity to effectively get rid of people who were dissidents in the island uh, and secure even more power for the Cuban government. On the 15th of April 1980 the boat lift began. Typically turning the situation to his advantage Castro simply exported his enemies and sent them over to his biggest enemy the United States. He emptied jails and filled the boats with thousands of people he deemed undesirable. And so one of the ways he's been able to survive is to think one step ahead, to take crises and make them into opportunities for his own survival, to uh, find ways to have his enemies neutralized in the sense of their own power being undermined, their own credibility being undermined. In 1989, Castro was about to take his toughest blow ever and lose his most important ally. The collapse of the Soviet Union led people to think that Castro would soon follow, that the, Cuba was receiving subsidies from the Soviet Union in terms of higher prices for its sugar than the world market and lower prices for the oil. And when the Soviet Union was no longer this sugar daddy, the sense was that Cuba could not survive. Between 1989 and 1993, the Cuban economy drops by about one-third. This is a huge collapse uh, in a very short uh, period of time. Hardship affected everyone in the country. Uh, it meant that you did not have enough food for yourself and your children. Uh, friends of mine literally uh, shed pounds and looked uh, uh, in terrible physical circumstances. How Castro survived this time was by bringing back the two things he abolished when he first came to power, the US dollar and tourism. The Cuba tourism industry was practically non-existent at the end of the 1980s. In 2004, a little over two million tourists visited Cuba, so it's a very big change foreign direct investment, tourism, 
third important change is to allow Cuban Americans to remit dollars to their relatives and friends in Cuba that by the beginning of the 21st century is worth something in the range of a billion dollars. Many scholars and Cubans argue the best way to get rid of Castro is to end the embargo, the official U.S. policy forbidding Americans to do business with Cuba, which has been in place since 1962. They say he uses the embargo to prop himself up, and that if it were lifted, Castro would crumble under the weight of his own failed policies and mountain of excuses. Fidel Castro wants the embargo the U.S. embargo gives Fidel Castro control. If it was unfettered trade and ideas and everything else that comes with uh, full relations, they said he would be out of here. Now in his late 70s, it seems time is Castro's greatest enemy. Despite all the efforts to eliminate him, he still stands as the last of the Cold War warriors. He's outlived them all, Kennedy, Nixon, De Gaulle, Mao, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, even the Cold War itself, becoming one of the longest ruling leaders of modern times. Fidel Castro's legacy has a combination of elements. It completed the country's social modernization. Uh, it taught every Cuban to read and write. It raised the median schooling level in the workforce dramatically. It transformed the Cuban health system. It also represented, unfortunately, a period of extraordinary harsh repression. Thousands of dissidents have been imprisoned or executed in Castro's Cuba. Thousands more have fled or been exiled. The legacy, therefore, is mixed. Uh, it had, no doubt, certain areas of accomplishment, but on balance, uh, it is a history that was needlessly harsh, that was abusive, and that committed damnable acts. Both enemies and friends acknowledge the prowess of the man who started with a handful of guerrilla rebels, seized power, and held on to it for half a century. He has outlasted both his Cold War enemies and his Cold War allies. Against the odds, Fidel Castro is a survivor. The sign that electoral politics were not an option and that trying to engage peacefully would just lead one either to a jail cell or to exile. On the 26th of July 1953, Castro made a reckless radical move. He led a group of about 150 men to storm one of the biggest military garrisons in Cuba, the Moncada Barracks at Santiago de Cuba on the eastern side of the island. The goal was to seize enough arms to mount a military revolution. The result was a bloodbath. They failed miserably. Many of them died. Those that weren't killed were sent to jail, including Fidel. Castro, however, turned the defeat into a platform for victory. The 26th of July would mark the birth of the Revolución in Cuba. Castro has a way of converting almost all defeats or potential defeats into mobilizing activities. That is, activities that he uses then to turn the situation. In 1953, Castro should have been dead.
July 26th became a campaign slogan, the new name of the new movement to overturn the government. He survived secret CIA plots, undercover mafia assassination attempts, and even the threat of nuclear annihilation. The weapons of war must be abolished. He turned Cuba from a colonial paradise into a player on the world stage. Our troubles in this hemisphere are being generated by Castro's Cuba. This is the story of Fidel Castro, a communist icon who's ruled Cuba for half a century. A dictator only 90 miles from U.S. shores, who's outlasted nine American presidents. This is Castro, declassified. A tropical island paradise spilling with rum. Rumro's trial was televised, a bad mistake, giving him the perfect national stage for his stirring oratory. The man who should have been picked off by Batista and his mighty army, the man who had just a handful of ragged revolutionaries, rallied the country. He essentially says that he did the right thing, the patriotic thing the necessary thing, that he was the defender of the Cuban Constitution, that he was the defender of the Republic, because Batista had usurped power in, in the 1952 election, and that all Cubans should really have followed him if they were patriots. From prison, Castro produced a manuscript of his words, history will absolve me. With public opinion firmly in his favor, and thanks to pleas from Castro's politically connected family, he and others were released in an amnesty after serving less than two years. But informed of Batista's plans to have him killed after his release, Castro fled to Mexico to plot his next move. On the 26th of November, 1950, and roulette. This was the Cuba most Americans knew in the 1950s. Glorious beaches, glittering casinos, gambling, music, dancing. In the 50s in, in Havana, it was wide open. I mean, I had many conversations about my father, about what it was like. And you have to understand that it was basically paradise. I mean, anything you wanted, you could get. But just below the surface, the rhythm of revolution was beating. In the urban underground and throughout the Cuban countryside, people were demanding change. The unrest stemmed back to 1898, when Cubans fought to rid themselves of their Spanish colonial masters. But then the United States intervened, committing nearly 20,000 troops to fight for Cuba's independence. An even bigger investment would follow. Cuban sugar, Cuban water, Cuban electricity, Cuban telephones. The entire economic infrastructure of the island gradually was bought up or invested in by American capital. And this, of course, laid the groundwork for a great deal of nationalist sentiment in Cuba. This was the Cuba that Castro grew up in, in the 1930s and 1940s. Fidel Castro and the young university students who begin to cut their teeth politically and want to create a Cuba for themselves, their nationalism revolves around getting the Americans out. 1952. With corruption in the government rampant, a young Fidel Castro decided to run for Congress under a clean government party banner. But just before election day, the self-appointed chief of the military, Fulgencio Batista, cancelled the elections, pushed out the Cuban president, Carlos Prio Socorras, in a bloodless coup, and took control of the island republic 
corruption increased. Batista also felt free to dip into the national treasury, to ignore the national budget, to allocate the nation's resources at his own personal discretion. He did not see much of a distinction between his private use of power and the public purse. The coup really became the straw that broke the camel's back. 